Welcome to the Growth Minded Accountant Podcast, where our experts will share best practices on running your firm in the digital age. This podcast is brought to you by Counting Works Pro. Let's get started. Well, hello, my name is Lee Reams with another session of the Growth Minded Accountant uh, from Counting Works Pro. I am the founder and CEO of Counting Works Pro. We are a digital technology software provider that works with tax and accounting firms across the country, helping them establish the digital footprint. Today, I am joined with Daniel Athlon, a seasoned marketing and LinkedIn expert to talk over how LinkedIn can create opportunities and conversations that lead to new business. So I wanted to start saying welcome, Daniel. I know you're in Israel. It's eight o'clock right now. So I want to thank you for <laughs> it's not staying up late yet. But if you could introduce yourself and share a little background uh, to our audience so we get an idea of who we're talking to. Thank you very much, Lee. I'm very glad to be part of the growth-minded uh, accountant. Um, I joined LinkedIn early in 2004, and two years later, I held a, a quota-carrying uh, position, and it started very badly. For months, I was struggling to to get close to my quota and couldn't find anything. And until one evening, LinkedIn showed me the name of the person I needed to reach out to within the organization. So when you and I look at this today, it seems like a no-brainer. But back then. It was like a, like a kid entering a candy store because a third of my time was dedicated to find the name of the right person within the organization that I needed to reach out to. And long story short, I beat my quota. I decided to dive into LinkedIn. And since you hit record, hundreds of people have joined LinkedIn. Every second, according to LinkedIn statistics, three people sign up. It's an amazing platform. Yeah, and I think, so before we get into the the pros and cons and the the there's a lot of angst about social media, especially in the tax and accounting space. So one of the questions I would start out with before we go in, we you and I obviously know how well it can work. We use LinkedIn in our own business. We use LinkedIn for our clients business. Um, but why would you say, you know, accountants, tax professionals, especially in the US that are a little wary of social media and LinkedIn is different. It's not like tradition. It's not Instagram for sure. It's not TikTok. But why should they start paying attention specifically to LinkedIn? Great question. Two quick answers. One is that anytime I Google the accountant's name, their LinkedIn profile will top the list for most people. Not my clients. <laughs> okay. Go ahead. <laughs> okay. For 99% of, of, uh, of people, when you Google them, their LinkedIn account will top the list, whether they logged in this morning or, or six months ago, it doesn't matter. So you have to manage it you can't you can't have it there in a, in a non-professional way and truth to be told linkedin is not really a social network it's a business network and it's a professional network it's heavy it's conservative it's traditional and if you're looking for an additional reason it's it's the only a platform i know where you can succeed without heavily sharing stuff that's interesting in, okay when you look at it, you, you mentioned Instagram. If I disappeared from Instagram for six months, then I will lose my following. Whereas if you don't share on LinkedIn or you don't share often, the power of the network and your profile are enough for most people. Of course, if you share smartly, that could uh, help you grow your practice. But it's not a must. It's just an, an option. Okay, so let's get into... I'm not. I'm going to go a little off script of what I I talked about with you earlier. I, let's get into a little bit of then. Uh, it's not a sharing network. So, what is the the first step? Like, what is the strategy? What is this? so a little background? So I understand that you know what is your point of view on if it's not a sharing network, what is it? How do what is the strategy to be successful? Excellent. The preliminary question would be: Are the uh, business owners clients on LinkedIn? And if you find that there are, then you must pay attention to the platform. But it could be that some of our listeners here will say, no, my clients are, are not on LinkedIn, and that's fine. So go go fish where the fish are. If they are on LinkedIn, then the three or four steps I would consider as a general framework is first tackle your online presence, your profile, and maybe your page. Then have a smart connection strategy. The third step would be decide whether you share or curate other people's content or your own. And the last and the fourth and last one would be lead generation through LinkedIn. So start by looking at your own uh, presence and then think about connections and only then content and lead generation. 
Yeah, and I would uh, add to what you just said. There's a couple of things. For obviously, all of my audience's clients are on LinkedIn, um, whether that it be a professional taxpayers or it be businesses and employees of other businesses. But the reality is, too, the, the prospects, we, we talk a lot and, and for, with our clients, we try to get them to understand what positioning is and how to down uh, your focus. So niche down is a lot of times we say. So a lot of times accountants specifically, they're too much of generalists. So meaning they offer every service in the world. And when you get down to it, when someone's Googling that, you're one of millions versus I am a CPA who specializes in restaurants in uh, Orange County, California, right? So that's a very specific area of expertise. It's much easier to stand out. So there's also the opportunity to find the prospects that are restaurants in Orange County that I would be looking for. And there's filtering tools and other things. So kind of explain if you were looking at it from that point of view, you know, how a, an accountant could use the tool. Excellent. So first, uh, uh, I couldn't agree more with niching down. It, 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 most people are afraid of it, but, but you know that if you try to sell every, to be everything to everybody, you end up by serving very few people. So let's take the uh, Orange County uh, restaurants. What happens is that when you um, manage to serve a few restaurants, then you'll you'll gain to to uh, significant information about their specific business needs, the seasonality of their business, and what their expectations are. So the third or fourth client, instead of just r- running to learn what happens with other uh, hospitality or other businesses, you you would know a lot more, and you would be able to provide value much faster faster. And in terms of finding your clients through LinkedIn. There are many ways to to go about it, but if you connect with people you know well, then Lee, you will be able to to gain a meaningful introduction thanks to a mutual connection, someone you know and someone who knows the restaurant or the chain uh, owner. So so that's also something that could uh, be interesting for some of our audience here. Okay, so would you then, in our example, and, and we could take it off of this example as well, so I, let's start with my profile. So I, I'm going to do I'm going to I'm going to use LinkedIn as a marketing funnel for myself. I'm going to have a strategy. So if I were focusing on a niche, like a niche down, like we're talking about, I'm assuming my headline, maybe my images, my bio, the stuff I write about myself on my profile, is that where you start and, and start optimizing there? Yes, you got it. So uh, I'll suggest uh, three questions. The first question is, who's your LD reader on LinkedIn? So let's assume it's a, an, an Orange County-based uh, restaurant owner. The second question would be, what action, Lee, would you like that restaurant owner to perform if we made that owner visit your profile? So what would be your, your uh, would you like them to uh, to go to uh, uh, your website? Would you like them to go to uh, counting, countingworkspro.com? Would you like them to, to do something else? What action would you like them to perform? Oh, on my side? Yes. Yeah, so I, I, I would, I'm asking you because there's a bunch of different ways okay. to do this, right? So uh, in my point of view, if this is the beginning of a relationship, I wouldn't go straight to here's my price and here's my package. By now, I would probably try to showcase my expertise. I would try to have content on my LinkedIn profile that shows that I know what I'm talking about, perhaps links mm-hmm. to webinars that I've done, podcasts that I've done, white papers, whatever, my own blog, my social profiles. I would try to educate and basically pre-sell through my digital assets. So by the time they read all this about me without even contacting me, then they're ready to start a conversation. Let's do a 15 minute discovery call. They're already pre-sold, read my reviews, and now they become a client. That's what we do for our clients. I wanted to see what how, how you would uh, approach the same thing. I think the approach is, is great because uh, if you, you, you can't find someone on the street and, and, and uh, go from one day to, to, uh, to marriage and you need to educate them. And LinkedIn is best for if you want uh, to educate the top of funnel, the awareness stage, and if you have evergreen content that tackles the specific issues that restaurant owners have in Orange County, so producing or curing content around that is likely to make more people discover you. Okay, so the second question would be, what action would you like those business owners to perform once they visit your profile? And let's say reach out to you, visit your website. And the third question, the last question would be, if a restaurant owner just looked at your profile, are you providing them with the right information at the right time, in the right order for them to go to your website and decide that you are a part of the solution? And I'd like to draw your attention to what I see on your own profile. 
the way they would tweak it is you, when I when I look at your profile, the first thing that strikes me visually is the banner. You may be surprised to, to learn this, but most accountants don't upload a banner. So this is an action that can take 30 seconds and that is likely to make anyone visiting your profile stick and read more about it. And if you're niching down, then maybe the banner should reflect your specialty. Maybe it should be from a restaurant convention in Orange County. And if I see that within a second, I am more attracted to read a bit more about you. And you mentioned very uh, uh, correctly the headline. By default, the headline would be, you know, lead CPA XYZ. But it doesn't really educate our readers. And the best thing to do would be to tweak our headline and make it about them. So instead of saying that I am the CXO at whatever uh, accounting firm, I help uh, uh, restaurant owners, and then you insert the value that you bring them. My, my, when, I, when I had discussion uh, with my own uh, accountant, my accountant thinks that I'm paying for tax services. But me as an individual, as a business owner, I pay for the peace of mind knowing that I won't be surprised and that I'm doing, I'm planning uh, uh, my, my, uh, my my expenditures in, in a smart way is something I can pay a lot more than commodities, than, than you know, with, with TurboTax or Pilot or anything. Tax preparation is not where accountants might gain uh, uh, additional margin, but tax planning is could be a lot more important and a lot more beneficial for them. So it, try to educate and consider educating your ideal prospects about the benefits and what, what what does tax planning actually mean for restaurants, for restaurant owners. And the best thing about it is that when you're niching down, more and more restaurant owners are likely to be attracted to you because they, they know what you're talking about. They see it instantly. They recognize the value you bring to the table. Yeah, there's uh, we call it perceived value. So, uh, if someone if if a uh, if someone who owns a restaurant will stay in our, we I like our narrative. I like our story. So I'm a restaurant owner and I'm looking for a CPA or an enrolled agent, for example. And I'm googling and I'm comparing. Or I find people on LinkedIn. Um, when I hit their site, if I can see even testimonials or case studies from six other or five other restaurants that you've worked with, it already gives me like whoa, whoa, this person knows what they're talking about. And we, we like to say there's two ways. There's a benefit to the pro, obviously, because the pro already knows the questions to ask. If you're a generalist and you get this type of client, you have to research their vertical. You have to learn all about their business. You're going to have to listen to them, talk to them before you start realizing, okay, this is their pain point. This is where we take it. With this uh, technique or specialization, you already know the answers. You're going to be able to walk the client down. And more importantly, you're going to get a price premium because the perception is this person is an expert in the field. You are a thought leader. And I think that's the important thing. So I want to get, pivot a little bit so I get it. So I'm going to create imagery on my profile that kind of talks to the audience. I'm going to use a headline that talks to their pain points and the value you're adding versus I am a CPA with 16 designations after it. And, you know, quite honestly, someone will look at that and go, oh, my God, I, I don't even know what all this means. What should I do? So I've created this profile. It start and I write. Well, actually, let's talk about this. The yep. what you write about yourself. So sometimes yep. it, it is not necessarily a resume, mm -hmm. is it? It's more of you're telling a, a narrative and a story, aren't you? That's that's a great point you're making here. Because if uh, you're a business owner and an accountant or a CPA, then you shouldn't think about LinkedIn as a place for you to hunt a new job. And you should think about your own LinkedIn profile as a website that needs to convert your ideal reader into reaching out to you. And there are a number of ways to do this, but first, it, it's a mindset uh, issue. It, the limits are not LinkedIn. The, the LinkedIn, the limits are really our own mind. And when I, when I get when I look at your profile, I see the the rich media that you're adding. I see the featured elements that you can add. And I also even look at the the uh, URL that you created for your uh, uh, profile. And that tells me that you put a lot of thought into branding your own LinkedIn presence. Everything we mentioned so far, Lee, doesn't cost a dime. It does require some thinking, but you don't have to run pay, paying for a LinkedIn premium account. You need to get 
uh, really well acquainted of what what's working in on on through LinkedIn under the hood, and you simply have to dedicate some time to building your presence, connect with the right people, and then generate more leads. All right, so let's talk about because there's two issues, two topics I want to get into: uh, connecting, yep. and then from there, what is that conversation? And you had said you don't necessarily, you know, what type of content you're sharing or how is so let's say we connect first because that's before I think we get too far. So I, I can filter out people that I'm looking to target. I can find uh, people like people. I have the, the core group that I already have. So I guess the first thing is if I have a client base. I would say, hey, client base, send out an email the old way. Hey, everybody, I'm on LinkedIn. I'd love to connect with you. I post a lot of I share a lot of my content from my newsletter, my blog, any breaking news, life events, things that you should be aware of please follow me. So then you you create an audience of your current client bases, but then they get you get first, second, third um, right. connections. So explain to me how you would suggest an accountant build out a uh, their network. So one is a client base, but two is if they're going after specific types of businesses, you know, those are two different types of uh, strategies, I guess, but two different ways to look at it. You're absolutely right. So the question I would try to ask is, uh, are you interested in, in three years' time? Would you like to be the best connected or would you like to be the most connected? I'd like to be the best. Fine. <laughs> so what does that mean? You have turned lead the creator mode. Maybe we could touch on that because the creator mode that LinkedIn has uh, uh, rolled out is an excellent way for you to keep in touch with a certain amount of people you know well, and they would be connected. They would be the first. Whereas enabling anyone to vi to follow your content on LinkedIn without necessarily watering down the quality of your network. Okay, so why am I saying that you need to, to pick one, either most connected or best connected? Because the, the greatest uh, uh, upside of most connected is exposure. And the greatest upside of best connected is referrals. Now, maybe it's different in in, uh, in your business, but in my business, what I found is that referrals are responsible for probably 90% of my own practice. And they, like you said, they come pre-sold, they're less price sensitive, and they end up referring other clients themselves down the road. And this can only happen when you connect with people you know well, because if I look at your profile and I see two mutual connections, and one of them is a client that, that would recommend you 24-7 and, and the second doesn't know anything about Lee, then you will not be there to say, you know what, forget about the, the second one, please ask Jane Doe. So you're, you're responsible in, in, through, uh, in my eyes, both for the way your own profile looks and you've done amazing work creating a customer-facing profile. And Lee, you're also responsible for the names of the mutual connections some prospects may see. Because if I'm busy, if I'm a restaurant owner in Orange County and I see two names and I go to these people and I ask them, should I speak with Lee? And they say, Lee who? We're in trouble. But if they tell me, of course, you need to speak with Lee because because Lee has helped us grow our business and he knows everything about what you, what you need to do. Then when I speak with you, I'm likely to become a client of yours simply through that person's or, or those people's uh, recommendations. So either most connected or best connected, try not to stay in between because the natural tendency of every business owner is to tr start with quality and then think they need to reach, uh, sorry, start with quality, then think they need to reach some quantity and they end up not really having quantity. Quantity on LinkedIn or exposure starts with 25 or 30,000 people simply because most of our network is not visiting LinkedIn on an hourly or even daily basis. Some are, you know, popping in and, and there's a trigger. So you send someone an invitation request, so they will check you out. But that could be seven days down, down the road. So exposure is often over, over overrated because you need a really 30,000 connections in order to gain from that exposure. And if you have 3,000 connections, then on the one hand, you polluted the quality of your network. And on the other hand, you gain only marginal exposure. Pick one. And if you can turn on or, and play with the creator mode that enables you to keep your network clean and high quality, 
without jeopardizing or with gaining additional exposure to the content that you mentioned. All right, so let's talk about a strategy of connecting. So I've I've connected with my clients or my clients connected with me. Are you using, do you recommend third-party tools to automate some of the outreach? Uh, LinkedIn obviously has some um, quotas. They only allow you to do a certain amount of, uh, of activity. Accountants are very busy. Kind of what is your, I don't want to ask that question first. And then the second question is, what does that introduction message sound like to someone who doesn't know you? Excellent. So short answer for the first question, no, I wouldn't recommend any automation tool specifically for this. I'm, I'm fine with sharing automation, everything you mentioned earlier. Okay, if you have a blog post, then sharing it smartly on LinkedIn can, is, is something you can both train and intern or have automated. But the connection is, is part of who you are as an individual, as a business owner, as a leader. So I wouldn't recommend that. And, and let's, let's imagine that I'm, I'm visiting LinkedIn and I see a great prospect and, and I notice that truly are uh, our mutual connection. Then what I would actually advise you to do, what I would do uh, if that were the case, is leave LinkedIn at this point. Because LinkedIn has enabled me to see the name of my prospect. And Leah's provided me with your name. And your name now is the most important asset here. But we don't have to stay on LinkedIn. There's a whole life outside of LinkedIn. And if I spoke with you and if I communicated with you and I asked how you've been and I and I would mention the the episode that you 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 uh, listened to with Jay and, and the great inputs I, I got through through that episode and then I would ask you about that prospect and ask you a very simple question. Do you know that person well enough to make an introduction? And I would respect your answer. If you say no, I have no idea who that person is, I would continue and I would find another way to do it. But if you say, of course, I know I will be glad to do that, then the actual introduction does not happen on LinkedIn. It, it would happen outside of LinkedIn. It could be an email that would be maybe the easiest way for most business owners. But if I knew that you were visiting you know, a, a football game next week and you would see that person, I would message you just when you enter the stadium and I will ask you if you can ask them about me. And then the follow-up would be thanks to your name. The, f the first five seconds would be simply because that prospect has recognized you and, the, and, and and I would serve that prospect well and I want them to go back to you and tell you, you know what, Lee, that guy has done excellent work. So in, in respect, it's somewhat of a, it's, a, it's third party proof, it's social proof, and you're utilizing the connections that you find in LinkedIn with current clients and you're using them. You're, you're saying leave LinkedIn, call them, email them, say, hey. I know you're connected to this person. You know, I thought they might be a good prospect for me. You know, is this someone I should talk to? If they say yes, then you're saying, hey, would you recommend to do a, you know, recommendation type email? So that makes sense. And that's a strategy that you utilize a lot. Is that what you're, you're and you think that works great for picking up business clients, I assume? Yes, for for, for service-based uh, clients and for, for people who connected with people uh, they know well, I think that's the best strategy uh, you should start with. Yes. Okay. Um, so when that person does that email and now they say, hey, yeah, I'll talk to you. What is your suggested recommendation to start that initial conversation with this new prospect who decided to respond for whatever reason? So you're still, you're basically a warm lead or a warm, this is a warm lead to you. Um, yep. But they, your reputation is just what their refer, referral did for you. So Kind of explain to me how you get through the door from there. So, and so the ideal introduction would be when when I ask that mutual connection, they would say, yeah, I would speak or I would make the introduction. And then I would also ask you a couple of questions about that prospect. And I would do my research and the questions I would ask you is not information I could gain through their website or their LinkedIn presence. I would try to, to, to uh, be as prepared as possible by knowing you know, just like buyers may make 80% of their research before speaking with a salesperson, so do we. So we I, I would I will need to know I will if it's an important uh, a client and it's a it's a restaurant, I would go and dine there. I would ask my Wi-Fi out, I would be I would be a, 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 a usual client. And then when we speak or when we meet, I would be able to mention things that only you as, as the restaurant owner would know. Something that would make you understand 
that I know your place and I know when I compare it to other businesses or other restaurants, I know what's working great there. And then my question would be about the next stage for you. What is the, how do you, how do, would you like that business, business to look like in six months time or in 12 months time? Lee, maybe some, some, uh, some uh, business owners would say, I want to uh, open a second uh, branch up north. I want to become a franchise. I want to sell my business. I want to, I want to, to have a, a better work-life balance. There are all sorts of answers. And based on that answer, then I would go and, and build the right solution for that person. Got it. So you're so we talk about this a lot, especially when you're starting any online, any lead comes in, Google that person, learn about it before you respond to them. It, it takes five, I mean, it takes five minutes. And by going back to them and say, hey, I see, thanks for reaching out. I see you're doing da-da-da-da-da. You can learn a lot about them from their website. Um, and you just put in some personalization from what you found. And right away, they're going to feel this is a little more personal connection. So now I'm creating a more personal um conversation really it's not me trying to sell so one thing that i find especially in the county space is with when you're selling your expertise you're selling the invisible you're not you can't you're not selling a product where there's a car and i see the car and i go buy the car so i don't know if you know what you're talking about or not so um i need to utilize so what we do for our clients is we establish the digital footprint we the first thing we do is we go get as many five star reviews for them as possible we make them look like the best of the best and we help them use content marketing, blogging, sharing their expertise, writing articles about things and getting that syndicated through where there's a lot of traffic to really generate a lot of uh, basically their Google algorithm score. Their brand is going to rank higher. Um, so when you're doing this with this approach, you now have the conversation. You're saying, OK, that, you know, where do you then ask for the sale? When do you start saying here, here I can help you? Um. If you remember the spin selling approach, very roughly, they, they, they uh, you start by asking the person about their situation, and then you ask about the issues or the problems they face, and then the implications, and only then comes the solution. So let's imagine two different scenarios. One scenario with a business owner who wants to grow their business. In other words, they have one restaurant. It's growing great, but they want to have three more restaurants in, in uh, Northern uh, California by the end of next year. Or they would say, "I'm uh, the restaurant is going great, but I can't see my kids, and I can't go on like that." Same situation, same. You know, if you're looking at it financially, then it's it could be identical, but the approach to, to use with the first or the second would would be completely def different. I don't think uh, um, a one size fits all can. We're not trying to sell a commodity. And, and by understanding the needs of the person you're speaking with, you you in some cases you would say, "I'm sorry, I'm not a good so I'm not a good fit for you." But let me recommend John, or let me recommend Jane, because I think they would serve you better. And you, it's funny, but I, I had a number of clients with calling me years after that the they heard that from me, simply because I referred them to someone good and. I, Really, the truth was I didn't feel I was the right solution for them. So the greatest benefit about this kind of conversation is that I'm really listening to their needs. In some cases, I would understand that it, we're not a good fit, and I would try to do my best for you to recommend someone. And in, in the uh, when they see that if you prepare good enough questions, then you lead by the quality of your questions. The second question already shows them you know so much about their industry and their location and their problems. They You don't have to sell. They want to buy. Yeah, so everything you're saying, I love hearing what we preach. Uh, we have what we call a 15-minute discovery call process for our clients. We educate them on how to use it. If you've listened or haven't gone through that session, we have another podcast and web webinars that I've done on that. And we basically start with the open-ended questions to start that conversation and then Based on that is how you change the narrative of the discussion. So you control the discussion. You're probing based on, you know, is that client is more of a cost issue? Is it a time issue? And then your narrative can change dramatically. At the same time, you know, you're able to qualify the prospect very quickly. Is this a good prospect for me or not? If, they're, if they want the lowest price and I'm a high price person, hey, this is great. Let's talk about it. But I think you should go with so-and-so. That's I think that's wonderful. Uh, perfect. So 
All right, we've gone through a lot of this. I want to start wrapping this up. One of the things I don't uh, don't think we've covered that well is the content that I'm creating and sharing mm -hmm. on LinkedIn to get engagement and then start basically nurturing my audience. So what what is the recommendation there? What's the purpose? So, so the purpose is to grow the top of funnel awareness to your solution. And, and the greatest one of the advantages of niching down, like you suggested earlier, would be that if uh, uh, I could speak with three restaurant owners in Orange County and I would understand the issues they're struggling with, then I would try to produce or curate content around that. Say they, they have a problem now with, with finding workforce or they have a seasonal issue that, you know, they're, they're for, for four months, they're, they're fully booked. And then for three months, they, there's two, uh, there, there's not enough people uh, visiting the restaurant. So you would try to think about those problems and find ways for you to get in front of them through educational content that is evergreen. Educational content, not this is my price for tax preparation, but educational content that goes to their issues and it, they need to understand within the first sentence that you know, you, you it, they need to imagine you next to them speaking about their problems. And the greatest benefit about it is that if you can manage to provide them a bit of value, taking them from point A to point B, then at the end of that process, you say, I could walk you through point C or D. And to do that, let's jump on a 15-minute discovery call. And you have earned the right to do that after you have helped them. So you need to help them. It could be simply rephrasing the questions they're struggling with. You don't have to have all the solutions. But if you're able to do that, then you have earned the right to take you to the next step. And that could be a 15-minute discovery call. And then you could grow your practice that way. So yes. content that result revolves sorry, around their needs, educational, and if possible, evergreen. Yeah, and so just so everyone understands, evergreen is content that doesn't necessarily change. Like a news article is something that is timely and it's dated after a while. Evergreen content is something that you're talking about that's affecting these people for a long period of time. You get it indexed and what happens is you get more and more people being able to use the content for a longer period of time. Um, so we do this for our clients at County Works Pro. We help them create content. We help them distribute content to all their social media um, profiles. LinkedIn, obviously, is one of the most important parts. So uh, as far as strategies, we do not do professional services. I know, Daniel, I think that's kind of some of the things that you do. So could you share with our listeners a little bit about if they wanted to work with you, how to do that? Uh, we're tight on time right now, but just kind of wrap it up a little bit. With pleasure, danielalfon.com. Oh, how easy is that? And you, you do uh, different packages, right? So they could easily kind of see this is a, how we start an initial consultation, and then you do strategy from there. Yes, there's a lot of content and digital uh, guides and downloads uh, on my website or sorts of articles and also an, an ability to, to buy a book, a one-hour call, where we would actually work. So if we had 30 seconds, I would ask you, where would you like those visitors of your profile to go? And then we would add that to make sure your profile reflects what you want to do. And then the other stages. All right, perfect. So we'll leave that domain name spelled out so you see it uh, in our description of this podcast. So it will be wonderful. So, Daniel, I want to pre I want to thank you again for spending time. I think this has been great. I think there's some good information um, and processes here that accountants can learn from. And I hope they uh, will spend some time, you know, taking uh uh, an idea of how I can move this into my practice. As you said, it doesn't st it cost anything to start. So it's definitely something we should talk about in the future. So again, thank you very much. I appreciate the time you spent. It's a pleasure. And, and I'm glad that you're working in, in helping uh, accountants grow their business. Yes, thank you.